This week is the 60th anniversary of the flight of Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space, and it's the 40th anniversary of the first flight of Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. To find out more, we're talking to space historian Francis French, who used to work for Sally Ride before she passed away in 2012. Please continue to share your thoughts with us about our podcast. You can do this via our social media pages, at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 146 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my god! You are listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to our podcast this week. How are you doing, Emily? I am doing great. It's been a while since we've uh, recorded together. I know you had an awesome holiday over here. At, I did. In, in Florida. Yeah, you guys did Disney and Kennedy Space Center and all that awesome stuff. We had the best time. I, I now know why you keep going back to Disney World. Yes. If you live relatively close, it becomes an addiction. It really does. Are you a pass holder? You know, it's funny. I am not, but I Florida residents get like discounts. I have a I have a Florida discount like summer pass. It's like a summer ticket. Right. And you can go like for three days, but it's really discounted. Like the each day is not very expensive. So that's what my me and my family are doing this summer. And I'm sure there'll be something similar in the fall. So once that's done. But yeah, we are me and my sister and my niece are just Disney freaks. We love it. We just got back from there this weekend. We went to the Magic Kingdom, had the best time as always. So and we're going back to Epcot soon. How good is that Guardians of the Galaxy ride at, at Epcot? Have you done it? Yes, I have. It is so much fun. It is intense. It's fast, but it's a lot of fun. Guardians is probably my favorite roller coaster at Disney. Yeah, me too. My second is probably Space Mountain just for sentimental reasons, because I've been on it a million times and it it never gets old for me. Like every time is like the first time going on it. It's classic. There's so much to do there, isn't it? It's exactly. just a wonderful place. And my trip my trip to Kennedy Space Center was amazing. Awesome. Uh, went twice, went out there twice. Uh, once with my girlfriend and then once with the rest of the family. And, and and it was it was just a wonderful time, wonderful trip and holiday for my mum's sixty fifth birthday, exactly what the family wanted and uh, I think we all had a great time. So yeah, good times, good times. And I got a few messages from people asking to meet up and I mm-hmm. wasn't able to do that because obviously it was a family holiday. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure I'll be back in Florida on my own at some point for a launch. Oh, I saw a launch as well. I saw a launch. Awesome. That was pretty cool. We saw a night launch from uh, the end of the jetty at Space View Park in, awesome. in Titusville. So yeah, that, that one's ticked off my list now. Done that. Awesome. So uh, that's cool. Yeah, and I know for people who are local, obviously they're all the time these days. But for me, it was it was pretty exciting seeing the sky light up, like everyone says it does. Even as a Florida, like somebody lives here, you know, as somebody who has access to that stuff regularly, it's still awesome. I mean, I try never to take that for granted because you know how many people can say, "Oh yeah, I just go outside and see a launch." It is really cool. I know Florida gets a lot of bad stuff in the press because of our government. I won't go that far into this, but. We do have a lot of access to things here that is just really cool and that I hope I never, you know, I hope I never get older. And I'm like, man, oh, yeah, just another launch, whatever. Like, you know, I hope I never take that stuff for granted in my life. Or, yeah, just another trip to Disney, whatever. Like, dude, come on. This is awesome. You know, I was talking to Lee Wilson, who we had on uh, the podcast before he he does tours at Kennedy Space Center. But he came he came on our podcast before I was talking to him. Um, we met up at Epcot awesome. and uh, he said uh, the, the thing uh, about Disney is it used to be called, it used to be marketed the happiest place in the world and now it's marketed as the most magical place in the world. And he said he's not sure which one of those statements he prefers because uh, it, it is certainly magical in a certain way, but the happiest place in the world for sure. I don't think I didn't have a smile on my face the whole time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am never miserable there. You know, even yeah. if it's 100 degrees, I'm still like, yeah, I could go inside and do something. Yeah, yeah, it is a very fun, happy place. And I, I 
yeah, I'm obsessed. Right, let's crack on. This week is a huge week for milestones in female spaceflight as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the first American in space and the 60th anniversary of the first woman in space. I'm not sure if it was just a coincidence that these flights took place 20 years apart, uh, but it certainly caused me a few headaches as we've been trying to figure out who to talk to about all of this. Fortunately, space historian, author, and friend of the podcast, Francis French, used to work for Sally Ride and has written about Valentina Tereshkova, specifically in his book Into the Silent Sea, which is well worth the read if you haven't done so already. Francis has, of course, been on this podcast a few times before, and in the show notes will be links to those episodes for those who want more of him, as well as links to his website and social media pages so you can find out more of his work and go and buy one of his excellent books. Anyway, let's talk to Francis. Roger that, Sally. So welcome, Francis, and thank you so much for joining us once again. So we are coming up on the 40th anniversary of the first U.S. woman in space, Sally Ride, flying on STS-7. But before we discuss this milestone, what were some other notable milestones for women in space before STS-7? Uh, the Soviet Union, for example, had flown women into space previously, and in fact, it's been uh, 60 years this week since the first woman flew in space. Well, thank you, Emily and Dave, for having me for this one. And it's uh, it's terrifying to think it's been 40 years until there's things I can remember um, as like a 12-year-old and 13-year-old, mm. people going into space. This was really when I got excited about it because yeah. STS-1 I got very excited about, but then the British television coverage kind of dropped off and we didn't really see anything until basically Sally flew in June of uh, 1983. And that's when the TV news kind of spiked again and to give you an idea of how old I am, there I was getting my VHS recorder out and putting my tape in and desperately trying to press record at the beginning of the segment, <laughs> not but not getting a whole bunch of stuff about goodness knows what else they were talking about, the Falklands or something that in that time, you know. So this is my era, but you're absolutely right. Um, Sally still gets referred to as the first woman in space in a lot of media. And that's not correct. She's actually the third woman in space, primarily because the Soviet Union was um trying to beat the Americans for headlines back both in the 60s and still in the 1980s when Sally was flying. Valentina Tereshkova was the first woman in space. I mean, she flew back in 1963, as you said, we're coming up on that anniversary. Um, yeah, she's 86 years old right now. She's still around. And this is a weird one for you, Dave. I know sometimes you like facts and figures. She was I the do. very last of those original Vostok 6 cosmonauts to fly. She was the last woman to fly solo for an entire mission. Those Vostok 6 all died in exact order of flight. Wow. Gagarin died in 68. Titov died in 2000. Nikolaev died in 2004, at which point I started thinking, I'm not going to take bets on this, but this is kind of looking strange. I wonder if this is going to hold. And sure enough, it did. Popovich died in 2009. Bikovsky died in 2019. So the only one of the Vostok uh, 6 who's left who flew in space is Valentina Tereshkova. Very strange. That's so weird. And at the time, at the end of that Vostok mission um, cycle, the Soviets had very little they could kind of get the headlines on. They'd sent two people into space at the same time, and they'd flown very close to each other. They couldn't rendezvous, but they could come close to each other. So what could the Soviets do to get more headlines? Well, they could send two people in space at the same time again on solo missions. That's not going to get headlines unless they put a woman in one of those spacecraft. The Soviets wanted the rest of the world to think that um, the Soviet Union was a place of equality where men and women could do exactly the same things. That was not true and has continued not to be true into the Russian Federation cosmonaut era. We see very few women in the space program. There generally is one at a time. Sometimes somebody stayed for an entire decade and then left without flying, at which point they'll appoint another woman. It's it's pretty woeful, actually. But um, Valentina was chosen as essentially she was a parachutist. Um, she was a textile worker who joined a parachute club. The one thing they really needed every Vostok cosmonaut to do at the end of the mission was parachute out of the spacecraft. Um, the rest of it could be flown pretty much automatically. So she had parachute skills. She also was the daughter of a military hero, as far as the Soviets considered, as somebody who died in the Russian-Finnish war of, I believe, 1939. Um, so, And she was the daughter of a tractor driver from a, a 
agricultural collective, very much like Gagarin's background. This mm. is somebody who'd come from a very humble start and had uh, ended up flying as the first woman in space. So that kind of the idea was for the Soviets to show that their their uh, society was equal. That the fact that she had not really been given any opportunity to fly as a pilot before, nor was that needed, kind of shows what things were actually like in the Soviet Union. That Soviet Finnish war is actually quite interesting because that was the Soviet Union illegally invading Finland, much as we're seeing in Ukraine right now. So um, oh, yeah. that actually kind of ties around to Valentina's story later in her life. Um, but she flew. She never flew again. The Russians didn't fly women again until around 1982, when, surprise, surprise, NASA had chosen women for their shuttle program. Sally Ride was about to fly, or certainly a woman was going to fly. It looked like it was going to be Sally. Things were beginning to get announced, and the Russians didn't want to uh, just rest on that laurel. So they chose, um, by that point, an incredibly talented pilot and parachutist who, who had many, many international records, uh, Svetlana Savitskaya, who um, was absolutely, I mean, a test pilot, not just a, a fighter pilot. And uh, she flew in 1982, became the second woman in space. And then, as we'll talk about a little bit later, when America was going to um, have their first woman spacewalker, what a surprise. She goes up there again and just in a, in a July of 84 and does a spacewalk as well. So it was pretty clear the Russians were making America be second or third in, in anything. Sadly for both Valentina and Svetlana, as people, we can't really admire them very much. As, as records, we can say this, these are incredible things that they, they did, but with the the Ukraine war as it is right now, both of them went on to become politicians. Both of them have served in the Duma and both of them have voted with Putin to have that illegal war in the Ukraine, mm. which is quite ironic considering how Tereshkova's father died. Both of them been sanctioned by the West. Both of them have all kinds of international sanctions against them as individuals. So while it's important to remember the incredible flights they made, it's also kind of important in this year to say they're kind of reprehensible as individuals because it's one thing to grow up in the Soviet Union in that kind of bubble of uh, propaganda and maybe not know what's going on in the outside world. Neither of them have that excuse anymore. So yeah. kind of think it's important because we have some Ukrainian listeners to kind of say they've really let down themselves as people. Absolutely. That's a really, really good point. Well made. Glad you brought that up. Yeah, me too. Before you got to the serious point, my thought process before that was, is uh, the name of the second woman in space one of the hardest quiz questions even for space enthusiasts because uh, I'm not sure many people would know that but maybe I'm wrong. I am not even sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly at this point I'm doing my best with it but I've heard it said different ways by different people so I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's my Manchester accent coming in to <laughs> mangle that name but uh, it's true um, in fact uh, you know Susan Still Corain who you've had on your show um, as a shuttle pilot is talking, giving a lot of great talks about what it's like to be the second person, because sometimes that is very difficult. Um, if you're the first, there's a lot kind of is on your shoulders. If you're the second, you can either succeed and people go, oh, well, you know, somebody's already done this. Of course, this was going to be fine. Or you fail, at which point people can say, well, the whole thing is, is questionable now because maybe that was a one-off. Maybe one person did it well, the second person didn't do it so well. So there's actually a lot more pressure on the second person. It was interesting to see, though, how how well she did in, in terms of being able to advance her career as a pilot. And uh, she's a far more fascinating figure in terms of aerospace career than Valentina Tereshkova, who I think kind of realized that was going to be it for her and and became an incredible figure during the 80s and 90s as kind of a symbol of women, um, went to a lot of international conferences. Conferences and I work with her in terms of writing a book and talked with her as much as I could. Um, I remember a particular evening, you'd, you'd love to have been there, Dave, uh, Secaucus, New Jersey. We was, I'm sitting in a bar with Valentina Tereshkova. She's waiting for Alexei Leonov and I believe Pavel Popovich to come downstairs, at which point they're all going to go out to Manhattan and have a drink. So she's just waiting in this bar and I can ask her anything I like. Um, she kept very much within the party line about her flight. It was all generalities. There are specific technical questions she was never going to answer. But that's also good as a figurehead sometimes. You want to be the person that knows how to say the the political bite-sized phrase, you know. So in that way, she was very good as a as a symbol. Whereas the number two, Savitsky, you know, she actually, it almost didn't matter whether she became an astronaut or cosmonaut or not, because she was already an incredibly accomplished, record-breaking test pilot. So were there any concerns or questions up to 1983 about how U.S. women 
could perform in aviation and, and during, you know, space flight, you know, pros or cons or or whatever. There were a huge number of questions going back to the beginning of space flight about how human beings would operate in space, about how women would operate in space, um, physically, physiologically, um, operationally, medically, you name it. Uh, um, some of which made sense because this was a new place that humans hadn't been to before. Who knew what was going to happen to the human body? Other parts of it reflect the culture of the time of both the Soviet Union and America and different decades and is as dumb as it can get. Some mm -hmm. of those, some of the ideas that people had about what women could do reflect the culture of the time. And any ridiculous question you've ever heard about, well, could a woman do this job? Could a woman be president? Could a woman run a major company? Could a woman drive a car, ride a horse, go out the house without wearing a head covering? Who, who knows what kind of questions? All of this was reflected reflected in the the time and so yeah you saw a lot of questions about whether women could pilot back in the world war ii era whether women could fly spacecraft in the mercury era and then when it came to the shuttle program because you've got a lot of military guys in that program there was perhaps a slightly more conservative feel a lot of guys have been around no nothing but other guys in their jobs many of whom have been totally honest since saying i was clueless i had no idea and these were the first women i ever worked with and they were incredible so there were a lot of questions. One name that keeps coming up as somebody that really pushed through all that is George Abbey. You know, George Abbey was the guy who was not the head of the Johnson Space Center out in Houston, but nevertheless, people assumed he held a lot of the power and he mm. just let them assume that. And as it was, he ended up being the guy who chose those crews for the shuttle missions. He was the guy who had a big part in selecting the original um, shuttle astronauts. And this was a guy who never made a huge deal out of making those very early shuttle missions as soon as they could be far more reflective of America as a society, whether it came to gender, whether it came to ethnicity. But he's the guy who, as soon as you've got those original 60s astronauts who'd never flown, sort of waiting on a mission for 20 years or so out of the way, all of a sudden you see pretty much on the very first flight, you see first woman from America in space. Next one, you see the first American, African-American astronaut. You All of a sudden you start seeing the folks who like, why are they going so early? Because George Abbey wanted it to be that way, because the shuttle program was going to be inclusive and representative. So let's fast forward a bit to January 1978, when the first six women, including Sally Ride, were announced as astronauts. You touched a little bit on this in the last question, but what was the attitude about this at NASA and among their colleagues at the time? If you were going to fly on a NASA mission any time up to 1975, you pretty much had to be chosen by 1966 or earlier. You know, the people deciding who was going to be announced in 1966, you're going back another couple of years. So you're almost going back to the first half of the 60s to choose anybody who's going to fly any time before 1981. So NASA had a huge backlog of, wow, we have been choosing people who all look the same. We're all from the same background, definitely the same gender, definitely the same ethnicity. And as an administration that really relies on senators and Congress people and the voters and the taxpayers, that wasn't going to hold. It didn't matter what NASA was going to want to do. That had to change. As it was, there were a number of key people within NASA who recognized this is what we should be doing and this is what we want to do. And then there are people like George Abbey who were like, I want to do this. I want to make this happen. Don't really know why George Abbey was so gung-ho about that, but thank goodness he was because he overrode the objections of some people who were technically his superiors and made some stuff happen there. So you've got um, some folks who were chosen, people like Ray Seddon in that first group of women astronauts who has told stories about how she was you know, working in an emergency room in a hospital and dealing with some pretty nasty wounds, people coming in saying, yeah, I, I slipped and fell. And she's like, yeah, that was a gunshot wound, you know, that kind of world. And then the, the next, almost like the next day, she's in front of the press at NASA where they're saying, what do you want to do as an astronaut? What do you want to be as an astronaut? And she's like, I don't even know what an astronaut is yet. I have uh, applied for this job and they gave it to me based on my incredible medical record. And I'm going to find out as, as soon as you can. Now I'm paraphrasing it here. Of course, Ray would say that far more elegantly than I just did. But these people coming into the program really didn't know what the program was either. NASA hadn't yet to finish building the space shuttle. Nobody had flown the thing. Everybody was learning at the same time. Incredible era, you know, both for what people knew and what people didn't know. Absolutely. It strikes me as quite bold that it was the, the seventh flight of the space shuttle that we're now about to talk about. That seems very quick 
in the grand scheme of things with how the world was then and 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 bear in mind the history of of space flight within NASA at that point. So let's zero in on that flight. Sally Ride, the first of these six women astronauts to be selected for space flight. What do you think distinguished her to be chosen for this significant moment in the spotlight? Oh, you're absolutely right, Dave, because people say, why did it take America 20 years to catch up with the Soviets in that way? But if you, us proud nerds and geeks and space, you know, insiders know this stuff, which is that's actually very fast. By the time you have the shuttle ready to fly in 81, for you cycle through all those people who have been hanging around since the 60s and get them, you know, in some senses out of the way by the sixth mission, mm. seventh mission, you've got the first woman. Now, why Sally Ride? That's a question that is fascinating. And my understanding, based on some people who were there, who know, who, who told me some stories, and a lot of this is in books and, and interviews as well, plus what I knew personally from working with Sally is she was very, very good at the office politics. You have to remember that by the time they chose that group, there's nobody in that group that could not have made that first mission as the first woman, yeah. America's first woman in space. They were all incredibly good. Um, so it's really a case of who do you choose amongst excellent contemporaries? Sally recognized or innately had in her, I think, that she was very good at realizing who was in charge that she needed to befriend. It's, it's not quite as calculated as it might sound, but it was just naturally how she was. Other people might go, I've got to impress the trainers who are I'm working with on the shuttle arm. And those are the people who are going to report to the person, report to the person, report to the person that I'm doing really well. Sure, that's a strategy. Or you could just cut around all that and while still being incredibly good in training, just re befriend the person who's in charge. Now, Sally Wright introduced me to George Abbey. The first time I ever met George was uh, when Sally when I and I went up to George and said, you know, I've I've heard a lot about you. And Sally said, It's not all true, you know, and it was they were laughing with each other. They were clearly very, very comfortable with each other. They'd known each other for decades. They they got on great. There's something where that ineffable, intangible, that everybody wanted to make friends with George Abbey, knowing that he was in charge. But if you tried too hard, it was pretty clear yeah. that you were trying to be the office suck up <laughs> and that wasn't going to work. Sally was great. And I saw this so many times in my years working with her at just befriending the person who was in charge in a very natural way. And she got what she wanted. It worked every time. Like I say, I, want, I don't want to make this sound too calculating, but it, it is a skill that people innately have or, or don't. She was in the right place in the right time to impress the right people. Mm. She was one who was just as talented as everybody else and clearly had everything that was needed to do it. But a little bit like Neil Armstrong, she wasn't somebody that was a huge self-promoter. She was very confident. Um, she knew how to express what she wanted to express. She knew how to say what she wanted to say. She was a great soundbite person when it came to talking about that. She also did not suffer fools. Um, and, and some of the interviews you see at the time, I know Emily and I have talked about this off public forums, but I'll, I'll happily talk about some of this too, is that, you know, Sally did not suffer fools. And that, but she did it in a way where NASA couldn't come to her the next day and say, you just embarrassed us. You okay. know, she was, she was great at that. You know, for example, you know, Bob Hope wanted her on his show. Now, Bob Hope, you know, is, so out of fashion this time at this point that it, it would be almost impossible. But at the time, apparently, he was still considered funny. I've never found the guy funny in my life. I've yet to <laughs> hear a funny Bob Hope joke. He's 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 awful. But uh, he was also incredibly sexist, you know. And so and Sally's like, I don't want to do it. And NASA's like, This is a great opportunity. She's like, Nope, not doing it. Didn't hold her back. There's a wonderful interview from about 1983 with somebody who Sally was had far more in common with Gloria Stenham, the, you know, the celebrated feminist, where Gloria is trying to come up with this question about, well, Sally, your sister is going into the church and you're going into engineering. And this is like two sides of a different coin. And you're, one of you is the spiritual, and one of you is the technical. And Sally just looks at her like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, like we're just two people. And it, it's a wonderful moment. You can see in her look, like she'll answer the question, but like, what is this? That way of being able to be true to yourself and being able to be honest while also not being too kind of po-faced and stiff about it, you're actually still going to do it, served Sally very, very well. You know, there's a, a legendary interview with the crew of SDS-7 where somebody they're going down the line and this male reporter asks Sally, like, you know, are you going to be emotionally okay? What if you start crying? And, you know, what, what would you do? Would you Would you swear at them? Would you leave the podium? Would you give him an answer that's like serious, but makes you look a little bit too kind of can't take a joke kind of thing. I mean, she just played it perfectly. She looked at this guy with all the withering contempt that that reporter deserved. 
and kind of laughed and said, yeah, why does Rick Hap not get these questions? You know, why does he not get asked? Are you going to cry while you're flying the space shuttle? You know, she played it perfectly. She didn't even have to answer. And I think that's a little bit like why they chose Yuri Gagarin, why they chose Neil Armstrong. Is that slightly intangible? Like, how are you going to deal with this for the rest of your life being the first that I think Sally, I think George knew that Sally could handle it um, and was a wise, wise choice there. So was that first mission for her and for a US woman a ceremonial position or did she actually have things to do? What, what was some of, the, of her significant milestones during that mission? That was the wonderful thing is that, you know, unlike the Soviet Union, where you could say that Valentina's flying was pretty much a, a tokenistic thing. She, she earned her flight. She did great. She was a wonderful ambassador for the rest of her life up until recent years. Um, but Sally had a reason to be on that flight, just as everybody had a reason to be on a shuttle flight. And this is where, this is my era of the shuttle. I love from 81 to 86 was kind of like the wild west of the shuttle. They were trying all this stuff. They've been for so many years of shuttle delays, ready to go and make this operational vehicle do some wild and crazy stuff. And this is the point where you have the pilot and the co-pilot in the front getting the stuff up there and back. And then you have all these specialists in the back itching to go and do things. So absolutely, they launched two satellites. Um, they also, you know, Sally's particular thing was launching this um, or letting go of this pallet, this platform, which had all these microgravity experiments on it kind of stuff they do on the space station now but before a space station what can you do on a short mission turns out mm. you can do a lot of stuff so she was the one who got the robot arm took this pallet out of the space shuttle's cargo bay let it go and then this thing did its thing did its experiments floating around in microgravity and then she retrieved it with the arm brought it back in using that robot arm was a fiendishly difficult task um as and it still continues to be one of those things that people have to when they're using robot arms study and practice, practice, practice so much. Early in those missions, when they didn't have a lot of experience with it, it was another whole thing like that. So that was pretty incredible what she did there. But nobody was going to remember the flight because of what Sally did with the robot arm. If, she, if she'd messed up, that would have been the headline. If she did well, it was going to be kind of forgotten. But the fact that there was an American woman in space was going to be the thing. So she had more on her shoulders than almost anybody. That was another part of her personality, though, I think, is like you see like a lot of women like this. I mean, Emily and I know Michelle Lucas, who runs High Orbit, it's the same kind of person. They are incredibly strong women running businesses, but they're all, they know how to mix it up with the test pilot guys. They know yeah. how to operate in that world. They know how to be around the, the jocks and kind of joke around with them, but also very much hold their own. So Sally had befriended Crip, Bob Crippen, who'd flown on the first shuttle mission. He was their commander. And between them, they actually worked incredibly well. So she was somebody who made part of the crew. He could just look at her and go, if I need to take today off, can you cover? And she had it. That was not necessarily her job as a pilot, but it was her job as a, a human, as a leader type. She was very, very good at that. So um, I think she found a, a way on a crew operationally, personally, engineering-wise, that covered all the bases more than you know. most of us can hope to do one of those things. She was the kind of person that could do all of them. So absolutely earned her place, deserved her place, and we continue to celebrate her place on that crew. All right. So by 1985, uh, U.S. women were making huge strides in space flight. Uh, for example, in, in 1984, two women, uh, Ride and Kathy Sullivan, uh, flew aboard the space shuttle during a single mission. And Sullivan also performed the first U.S. EVA by a woman. So why do you think it took so long for this to happen? You know, it's really 25, 26 years after NASA even started. Well, it, it, in terms of how long it took NASA to do it, yeah, it's a long time. In terms of how long it took, it took NASA to do it when women were in the program, it was pretty quick. So a lot of that reflects the culture at the time of uh, there weren't going to be women in the early Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, ASTP, Skylab programs because America was behind culturally. By the 1970s, it was a different world, and you start seeing that quick putting of women and other people on missions who you'd never seen in space before, which is a wonderful thing. When it comes to that particular mission in October of 84, yes, you see Sally making her second flight, very, very quick turnaround. Kathy Sullivan making that first American woman spacewalk, as we mentioned, um, beaten to the post on that one by the Russians who decided to make her the second. 
that was a weird mission. And that really shows what NASA was doing pre-Challenger accident in 1986 to try and race ahead. A lot of it now seems incredibly unsafe. A lot of it then seemed a little unsafe, and the crew had a lot of questions, and some of the other astronauts around there who weren't flying that specific mission had questions. One was they were trying to get the flight rate up. They were trying to get missions to turn around very quickly and fly again so the shuttle rate could go up. They could fly as many missions as they hoped. To do that, you've got to recycle experienced crews really fast. So Bob Crippen, having just come off another mission, was actually being asked to command that mission while he was still finishing up another one. To do that, what did he do? He said, I want Sally Ryder, my crew, because I'm going to be away for major parts of the simulation test, for major parts of the training. And I know Sally can step in as a commander and cover for me. That tells you how much she was trusted by him mm. and how much trust she engendered in others. So um, that kind of shows why those two were once again flying on the same mission. There, there isn't a mission that, that Sally flew that wasn't with Bob Crippen as commander. But what was Kathy Sullen doing on this uh, EVA? She was going to re practice some refueling techniques um, or some fueling techniques. They were planning when Bob Crippen was going to command the first mission out of Vandenberg in California on a, on a military polar mission. They were to do that kind of stuff. They were talking about fueling liquid fuel satellites in space for the first time to then launch them out of the shuttle's cargo bay to do that kind of thing, to essentially carry a gas station with you into space and fuel up a satellite is incredibly dangerous and incredibly silly. And as soon as the Challenger accident happened, they just canceled the whole thing. It was not wise. It was probably going to have caused some, it could have caused a huge accident. Um, even if things go okay, what happens if you have to come back to Earth and you haven't managed to deploy your satellite? You've got all that fuel sloshing around in your, in your shuttle as you're coming back. It, it now seems incredible they were even thinking about it. But this was the time pre-Challenger when they were trying to be very gung-ho about all kinds of things. You've got people zipping around in MMUs, the maneuvering units. You've got yeah. all kinds of people going out, grabbing satellites, bringing them back, repairing them, throwing them out again. A, a, a risky time, but an adventurous time. So that's what Sally was doing. I'm sorry, that's what Kathy Sullivan was doing on this mission. Her and Dave Liesma got out there and basically practiced without fuel, trying to like hook and unhook some of these hoses that they'd have to do that. Of course, very glad they did so because they learned there was going to be some things that were going to be a lot harder to do than they'd seemed. Other things seemed a little bit easier, but yeah, that's what that was all about. Right. Let's fast forward then to bring you into this story. So you worked with Sally Ride from 2005 at Sally Ride Science in San Diego. What was she like in her post-NASA years? To give you a little bit of backstory, you know, Sally had, uh, was going to fly a third mission um, then the Challenger accident happened. She was going to fly in the summer of 86, um, a satellite deploy mission. Then Challenger happened and she was pulled in to do the, um, the commission as to what went wrong with Challenger. She was actually the only person to serve on the Challenger and the Columbia accident committees and uh, was incredibly helpful there. Not only that insightful engineering mind, but she was somebody that could kind of slip some information around some of the official channels, uh, particularly about the O-rings that ended up being decisive in that report. And it was not disclosed till years later. So she knew how to work the office politics. She knew how to zero in on what the problems were with those shuttles. And so um, incredibly important. If she'd done nothing else in her career, working out what happened with those tragedies and how to fix them, again, is a, is a milestone. But she decided to leave NASA at that point. She was often touted and even offered um, the head of the NASA job. That was not something I don't. I think she'd want. She was an intensely private person. She was very ambitious. She'd push for what she wanted, but she wasn't somebody that wanted to bask in the limelight. And I think the idea of going to Congress every day as the head of NASA and uh, explaining what NASA was doing would have been her, her idea of hell. So she went off very much like Neil Armstrong, went off into teaching at a university. There are many people here in San Diego where I am today who remember going to some of her physics classes and being taught physics just as people went to university and were taught engineering by Neil Armstrong after, you know, there's that mm. person who walked on the moon teaching me a class. And here's that person who's the first American woman in space teaching me a class. You know, it was, they kind of reconnect with their academic roots and what they really love. But sometime in that time, and this is kind of where I start coming into the picture, Sally and her friends started looking at what does it take to make sure that other people, all those decades after America was flying in space, like you were saying, were still not waiting around to be the first. How can we get women into the STEM pipeline, the science, technology, engineering, math pipeline to go into careers where 
when it comes to those kind of selections of jobs, there are women all over the place, qualified, ready to go. So Sally and her friends looked at where's the stumbling block? And it turned out middle school for girls in this country was the place. So it's pre-high school where pretty much by the time you get to high school, you're almost on track for what you're going to do in college. It's after elementary school or primary school, as Dave will call it, where you know, you're putting your hand up like, oh, I want to answer this question. By the time you get to being a teenager, nobody wants to answer the question. You're all kind of hiding. And it's all to do with you know, what socially is okay. I don't want to be seen as too clever. I don't want to be seen as being the teacher's pet. By the time you get to high school, if you've sort of kept your hand down and not bothered working, it's too late. So Sally realized that getting middle school girls excited about science was the key. That was the moment. And you know, she could have spent the rest of her career just being on the speaker circuit, making millions of dollars. And she certainly did do very well on the on the speaker circuit and made a fair amount of money. But she decided to funnel her name back into something which is like making sure that a, a kid like her didn't have to go through all she went through to, to end up on a space shuttle. And uh, it was amazing. So she realized that peer pressure was the big deal. Girls were being thinking of science as being a really boring job. And they were not interested. And it didn't seem like anything they or their friends wanted to do. And by the time it was time to just choose what to do in college, it was too late. So she set up this company. Eventually, it was called Sally Ride Science. When I joined it, it was still kind of a startup. It was still mostly her and some friends she'd had through various parts of her career, her tennis career, her university career, people going back to her childhood. And as a group, they were trying to work out how to do this. And it was so much fun working there because it was still a startup. There was a lot of creativity, a lot of different directions we could go. And it was like working rock festivals around the country. We wow. were um, going to different parts of the country every week and we were doing what middle school girls would like that was not the stereotype. So they would show up at a university campus and there would be a street fair, there'd be balloons, there would be a keynote speaker, there'd be all these different workshops they could go to, mostly run by women who were them 10 or 15 years on doing really fun hands-on science stuff. As soon as the girls saw the, like this DJ and this, this street fair and, and thousands of other girls who looked just like them, they're like, okay, any conception I had of science being this boring solo activity where I got to wear a lab coat and be in a basement on my own all day, forget it. This is it's a community activity. This is great. So in that moment, in the moment they set foot there, we'd already converted them that science looked cool. And so she put a lot of her efforts into that. It was such a great, fun place to work. We also did Toy Challenge, which was an incredible competition we did, which was design the ultimate toy or game. And this was getting kids into the engineering design challenge. You can ask a kid, like, I want, I want you to do an engineering design challenge. And they look at you like, that sounds like hell. But if you say, I bet you could come up with a better toy or game than grownups can come up with because you're a kid, you know what makes a good toy or game. You can see that little mischievous look in their eye. They're like, yeah, I could do that. And it was... The engineering design challenge, it was the same thing, but working through toys and games, we, we would do that. And, and Sally had so many wonderful connections that she should have called on. We were in DC all the time at all kinds of amazing high-level departments who would just back us and sponsor us, and flying all over the country, finding kids, making documentaries about this stuff. It was a whirlwind couple of years for me as we just got these kids excited about toys and games and engineering. And I know we made a difference in, in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And it was all down to Sally a very private person being willing to put her name and her image out there and, and do that. And so it was a, a pleasure. I mean, I was there full time for a couple of years, but even when I left to take a different job, I stayed as a consultant and kept going until basically the day she died, because I was so proud to be continuing to do that work with them. It's interesting what you just said about how she was private and yet she was willing to put her name on this and, and go and do it. Did she relish her place in history? Or was the first US female in space tag a burden for her in some ways? That's a really interesting question. And I do, I think about Neil Armstrong, who I was fortunate also to work with in my time, though nowhere near as much as I did with Sally, and that they're both very similar. They're both quite private people. They don't really want to have conversations with people they don't want to have. And yet, they're very, very aware of their place. And it's something really interesting happens when somebody who is quite reserved becomes incredibly famous, ends up in like as a Billy Joel song lyric, for example, with Sally yeah. Ride, you know, who kind of, you know, the, and now you see her on stamps, on coins all over the place. What happens to them? You know, they, they are very fiercely protective of who they are, of what they represent, and they will put themselves out in very specific places. Like you saw Neil Armstrong all over the place in this country 
doing certain things for things he loved doing, like Purdue University fundraising, for like talking about things he really loved or things he really wanted to support. But if somebody came up to him and said, hey, I want you to do this, he would back away, almost recoil, you know, because it was like, this is not on my time or my agenda. And they become very good at saying, no, I don't want to do that with complete eye contact, with complete confidence, with you cannot be offended, you cannot be upset. They've just said no in the nicest possible way, but <laughs> your job now is to turn around and walk away. You know, it, it's beautifully done. and it, It's very interesting. I've seen a number of people like that, but those two are incredibly good examples. Sally, of course, you know, was very, very private about her personal life too, um, for reasons which really only came out on the day she died. And uh, that was another thing, working with her. You saw circles within circles within circles. You saw... The people she'd known in some cases almost her entire life and you know her sister was also a key part of the business these are people who she trusted and knew she could trust and there was kind of an inner circle and then there were people she'd brought in more recently in the college years who were like the next circle and then there was a bunch of us who were basically new hires who we were with them all the time but it was totally understandable that we were never going to be part of that inside circle of friends and why on earth should we you know we were trusted with the things that mattered to them the most, but we were never going to be that kind of trust because that kind of fame, you never know who's going to turn around and write a dishy tell-all magazine article about your goodness knows what. So there was um, an understandable level. And I, and it's only after she passed away did I really understand what a lot of that was about, but it was an understandably wise way of doing it. I mean, I worked security for a lot of those events and you did get some people who were like a little bit crazy, a little bit too, any name like that, people want to get a little bit too close. And there is unfortunately that extra level when if somebody is a famous woman, is that little extra level of, of kind of like, e, what's going on here that you've got to be ready for. There was a lot of that stuff that we dealt with behind the scenes that nobody else ever knew about that, um, all part of being famous. So does that answer your question about whether you want it or not? Yes, there was a lot of that being a burden, being a famous person. Did she recognize what she was and use that to the maximum in the way she wanted to? I believe she did. So I, I think she got the best out of it she could, given that it was both a, a trophy and a burden. You, you mentioned that she was obviously part of the commissions for the disaster, for the two shuttle disasters, and Columbia was quite a while after she left NASA. Was she still involved with NASA a lot and the astronaut office after she left? Or was, was she quite distant even from that close-knit astronaut community as well? Not to my knowledge, although there may have been many things she was doing. She would get invited to a lot of White House things because she was a name mm. in, in many ways like John Glenn, like Neil Armstrong, that they would pull in when they needed them. And if the, the politics aligned, um, she would be happy to show up for like President Obama's STEM science night where they'd have telescopes out on the White House lawn and they'd have bring in kids from all kinds of inner city areas to look through telescopes, kids who'd probably never been to the White House ever in their life before. She'd be quite happy to do stuff like that. But um, in terms of NASA, I don't know. I did not hear much of her being pulled into that kind of stuff. Certainly, I did notice generally in some of my space research, there are people who, when they finish their time in the space program, stayed at in Houston and were part of the fabric of that society. There are other people, just as Emily and I know, who complain about the humidity there, complain about the different culture of Houston and could not wait to get the hell out of there and back to wherever <laughs> they were from. And when you're from Southern California, as Sally was, and it's where I live, I do not blame her wanting to come back to the palm trees and beaches and sunsets and lack of humidity and, and everything that Southern California has to offer. Also being as, as liberal as Sally was, something I share too, I'm not sure I'd want to stay in Houston at that time. Houston's changed a lot since, but yeah, I don't think Houston was really her kind of her cup of tea, as Emily might put it. And uh, <laughs> the uh, California made a lot more sense. So once you get out of that being around every day, I think you tend to sort of slip out of people's minds as memory as well. Yeah. Uh, so I w recently was at Kennedy Space Center last week and had a a tour with Steve Smith, the shuttle astronaut. Uh, who became a national in 92 or 93, I think it was. He was in that class. And he, uh, like many of those astronauts, got rejected a few times. And he was trying to work out how to get selected. So he wrote a letter and he said, I wrote it to Sally Ride, Johnson Space Center, Houston. And he actually got a reply. So that would have been late 80s, early 90s, I guess. And apparently Sally wrote a fairly gen generic 
here's some tips on how to become an astronaut. But he really valued the fact that she took the time to do that. Um, so I, I wonder how many other people have similar stories uh, of, of her giving. I know Neil Armstrong also was a similar kind of person with that. We've given his time for, for aspiring astronauts and pilots in particular, wasn't he? Uh, but I thought I'd share that because you said you weren't sure and it was a story that I'd only recently heard, which I'd obviously not heard before. So I thought it was a nice story. Oh, that's a wonderful story. And how great you heard it firsthand as well. Um, because, yeah, that is something I, I personally witnessed, Sally, you know, affect tens of thousands of kids, mostly middle school girls. And you know that some of them are probably now, you know, we're talking about 2005. So just doing the math, we know some of them are already incredible people doing what they're doing. I've, I've watched some of the kids who did the toy challenge competition who were little kids go on to do incredible stuff as well. And it, it's, it's heartwarming to see, you know, I saw one of them in the, the Super Bowl halftime concert and thinking, wow, I know nice. somebody who was in the Super Bowl halftime concert. And I remember them when they were like, you know, 11 or 12 or something. <laughs> it, it's kind of fun. But it also brings up, um, you talk about applying many times. The fact, I think it might have been part of the reason for Sally's supreme self-confidence is she was very, very young when she was and she was chosen first time. She was still at Stanford University finishing up her doctorate, saw the announcement in the newspaper, um, the, the college newspaper, and applied. And if I if I got my math right, I think she was about 27 years old. I mean, which mm. who knows, you know, that we're, we're, we're in sort of Emily's Gem and Titoff territory for uh, how young she was in terms of like becoming to apply to be a national and then getting selected and getting selected in that first group and then being the first of the women to fly. There is no sense of, Oh, I, I had to wait around for my dream. I mean, she's not even out of college yet and she's doing it, which is just mind blowing. You know how quickly that kind of stuff happened. Right place, right time, right person. While I was in America, the first quarter I got had her face on it. Uh, the quarter for English listeners is a 25 cent coin. How do you think she would have felt about that kind of thing? Wow, that's uh, that. This is me speculating. I mean, to go into the inner mind of somebody else is is always like you know speculation. But she recognized that she was going to be a name forever um, in a book, and I think there was a certain amount of dry humor as to what was her and what wasn't. I remember hearing songs that people wrote about her where she, you know, I and I kind of ask her, you know, what do you think about that? And she would raise the eyebrow, which told me everything I needed to know, you know, <laughs> about how much she had liked the song or not like the song, you know, because you always want to respect that somebody else is trying to pay tribute to you. But some of the tributes she got were kind of like, oh, that's a little embarrassing, isn't it? I was there for the unveiling of the American stamp and her mother was there, her sister was there, many of the other family and many of that inner circle of people I mentioned were, were there. And it was wonderful. And I think a lot of those things are often for other people. I think yeah. particularly after she passed away and she was very young when she was selected. She was very young when she died. She was only 61, which is way too young to lose anybody. Never mind Sally Ride. So I think things like stamps and coins and uh, other tributes in that way, um, an incredible book that came out uh, by Lynn Sher, I think back in 2014, that kind of tells her life. Those kind of things are for other people. I think a little bit like Neil Armstrong, you know, Neil worked with Jim Hansen on that book, First Man, where Neil's like, I don't want to write a book. I don't even necessarily want to be going through saying you've got this right or you've got this wrong. I'll give you full access. You write the book and then I'll tell you if something's really wrong. But other than that, go do it because I recognize people want this, but I don't want to. I'm too busy doing stuff to really think about legacy in that way. So that's my guess. And it is only a guess because she was... Mm. The kind of person that really just with a very subtle facial expression, you could tell which way she was thinking or not. There are there are phrases she uses, um, which I still use. You know, she was my direct boss. So I spent a lot of time in meetings with her and I would see people give ideas to her and she was always polite. The phrase I've often kept and often use is, you know, that's not a bad idea. And I knew exactly what that meant. It's like, we are not going to do that anytime soon. <laughs> we may never do that. But I thank you for saying it because it isn't a bad idea. And I thought that is an elegant way of saying no, that I'm going to keep in my mind for the rest of my life. And so the, I think those are the kind of the things I remember more than in terms of the public legacy is those little kind of private moments where you're like, what can I learn from this person as a leader? And it's things like that. I'll still, if I ever say that to you, Dave or Emily, you'll, you'll, now you're going to know, and I'm sorry, but you know, that, those are those little things where you learn from any boss. And it was incredible to have Sally Wright as my boss. And it's quite surreal for me to, see mm. stamps and coins and go, oh, there's my ex bus on a stamp today. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's, it's odd, but, but nice. Absolutely. Awesome. 
So unfortunately, as as you have mentioned earlier, uh, Sally Ride left us far too early in 2012. So what is her legacy and what do you think she might be doing now if she was still with us? Boy, that's a that's a big question, too. Um, legacy has changed incredibly in many ways um, because it was really the day she died that many people knew that Sally was not only gay, but had been in a, a, a committed partnership with uh, Tam, who was my my other boss at the at the um at Sally Ride Science, you know, Tam and Sally were the kind of the, the co-founders of that. Most people found out that on the day she died. And uh so I think she's become an LGBTQ plus icon in a way that she didn't in her life, given the time that she was chosen as an astronaut, I think that was probably the kind of thing that would have been too much for America and the rest of the world, not only to have the first woman in space, but the first gay person who was out in space, you know, that would have been a, a difficult one. And they were those two first would have got mixed in ways that would not necessarily have helped either community, I think, based on what I know of the 1980s America. So she's become a symbol of something that she didn't live personally in her lifetime, but has become incredibly um, empowering to see now. I think legacy, part of the fact in many ways, like Neil, she did not go out and over promote herself, oversell herself. You know, clearly she was using her name, but in ways that was very helpful to inspire middle school girls um, mm -hmm. to write incredible books for kids there's a whole bunch of books by her and tam out there which are really really good for kids as well so legacy is in that way is what she created which is continuing and you'll see that throughout universities and colleges everywhere with these women who i still talk to some of them who were like i remember that from when i was 11 and now i'm working in this incredible job often in mission control and places like that um the rest of legacy of course when somebody passes away is up to the rest of us to kind of decide but i have yet to see anything that is not what I'd hope to see. You know, she's uh, she's remembered as a very driven person who did some incredible work, who who didn't embarrass the legacy. And, and part a huge amount of what anybody needs to do once they've become a first is is like not embarrass yourself. You know, I mean, look at what's happened to Charles Lindbergh, who at one yeah. time was fated as a hero and now is um, is vilified for his his uh, Nazi views, for his anti-Semitic views. You know, and it's it's very questionable legacy he leaves. Sometimes just not doing that is enough, you know, and the fact that Sally not only did not do that, but has done some other, left some other incredible things. I think she's somebody that is incredible to, to look at. What's wonderful too, is to look at it in the context of what else happened. You know, look her in the context of Valentina who flew that solo mission 20 years earlier. Look at her in the context of Eileen Collins, who did something that Sally could not do, which was actually command a mission only because of her piloting background. It wasn't something that was necessarily more skilled, less a skill, just different skills, but to see Sally make that first flight as an American woman, then see Eileen go on to pilot a mission. And then I happened to be there the day that Eileen commanded that mission and, and launched. And that was something where you saw women from every part of aerospace history, going back to the wasps, the wax, the women who were flying, you know, in World War II, just this celebration of look what women can do in aerospace. And, and Sally was there for a conference too. And it was just remarkable. So I think in the, the wide spectrum of women in aerospace and women in American history and women in world history, Sally's got her place with the dignity that an entire life well lived will, will allow. Francis, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, there was so much to cover within that. And as always, you've done it superbly. So thank you for coming on and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Thank you so much for having me. I love what you guys do. And uh, I, I look forward to listening to all the wonderful people you have on. You guys do so much good stuff. I can't wait to be one of your little call signs. And, and announce you guys as well. I, I want to put myself in the hat for that one too. All right. Well, we'll do that whenever you Lovely. want. <laughs> Never miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to leave a review. This is Space and Things. I love talking. I love it when we have Francis on. It was nice to have him on to talk about something positive uh, today. Often he's our person we call when, when unfortunately someone passes away because he's so knowledgeable and, and, and yeah. he does things so well but yeah it was great to have him talk about Sally and, and, and his experiences with Sally and I also loved how he connected and, and showed the difference between Sally Ride and, and Valentina Tereshkova I thought that was a really interesting topic and the way he handled that I thought was really really well well done which you would expect from him yeah he really uh, thinks about things all the way through which I really like. It is frightening what he was talking about. It's been 40 years since the first flight of Sally Ride. I remember it. I mean, I was real little, but I do remember it because it was a big blanking deal back then. Obviously, there hadn't been any U.S. women in space. 
I hate saying this, but in certain industries, there's still sort of a, you know, a bit of a sexist culture in it. And the space industry was kind of like that. Uh, not kind of. I'm I'm being gentle. You look at NASA, the first 20, almost the first 25 years, first 24 years was just exclusively men going to space and a certain kind of man, white guys. And not to pick on the achievements of any of the Apollo astronauts at all. What they did was incredible, but there was just no representation at all. None. As a result, you know, a lot of people developed this attitude like, well, only a certain type of person can fly in space. And really that astronaut class, the 1978 class, I mean, they they really changed everything. They they proved that not only, you know, African Americans, women, Asian Americans can can be selected to be an astronaut. I mean, just to be selected to be an astronaut, you got to be the cream of the crop, right? I mean, they just don't mm-hmm. select they they're not selecting me for this. We'll just put it that way. And you know, the fact that they flew in space and they that whole class accomplished so much well into the late 90s. And they're still out there. You know, unfortunately a few of them have passed away over the years, but including Sally, right? But there's st- many of them are still out there. And they're still incredible ambassadors talking about space flight. I mean, you got guys like Fred Gregory out there, you know, talk about space flight still. You know, he's still very active in the community. You know, you got Ray Seddon, you got other uh, Anna Fisher, you got other women from class who are still really carrying the torch. Yeah, Kathy Sullivan's um, got her own podcast. Yep, Kathy Sullivan's got her own podcast, and she's still a badass. I mean, excuse my language. I think she went to the Mariana Trench. A few yeah. years back, I believe she was the first woman to do this, uh, I think, by herself, at least. I mean, that is freaking amazing. These people just keep up. They just keep going. And it's just an amazing astronaut class. And it's amazing what they ushered in for the rest of us. I don't think I'd be here talking about space had it not been for that class at all. Because if I hadn't seen Judy Resnick in The Dream is Alive, And I hadn't heard about Sally Ride being, you know, wow, she's the first woman in space and having experience that I wouldn't be here. There's no way because I would have liked space flight, but the message would have been like, you can't be included in this. I'm just amazed it's 40 years. It doesn't seem that long. We touched on it briefly. It's amazing how Sally Ride has become so ingrained in popular culture as well. Things we talked about, the Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire, which is obviously a, a, a passing lyric in. And yeah. the stamps and the coins and all that kind of stuff. But that flight we talked about with Sally Ride and Kathy Sullivan was a poster in uh, in a background of an episode of Stranger Things recently, which shows just how iconic the space shuttle at that time was. You have a period piece set in the 80s on TV and you have to have an image of a space shuttle crew or a space shuttle as part of that. It's important. Sally Ride is such an iconic part of that that it tends to be her face you'll see amongst those those images and it's oh, yeah. great to hear that that hasn't gone to the wrong person does that does that make sense yeah like we find with neil armstrong and it's weird they both died in 2012 as well and, and the, the comparisons of, of of their personalities and how they were such good people to be the first at something yeah oh yeah um, within american society yeah, they absolutely pick the right people. I think it's a real shame, sadly, and I understand why she felt this way, because in the 1980s, if you happen to be gay, I mean, Reagan was in office. There was a uh, disease at the time coming out in the United States that had a very big stigma attached to it, you know, being a gay disease. It was AIDS. Yeah. And, and that's, of course, not true. Many people who are not gay have gotten AIDS for whatever reasons. And we shouldn't judge anybody who gets a deadly virus. But anyway, if she had come out in the eighties, it wouldn't have probably gone well for her, which is horrible. It shouldn't have mattered either way, but being how things were in the 1980s with Reagan in office and stuff, I don't think it would have been well received. And it's really a shame. She wasn't able to be out during her lifetime. I really think that's heartbreaking because she deserved to be happy and she deserved and i understand her private life was private i understand that and maybe she didn't want to be a role model for she didn't want to be a role model in that area and i understand that not everybody wants that i get that but it's just i find it sad that during the 80s she really had to keep 
everything under wraps because the climate was just so bad and it w- she wouldn't have been treated right. I mean, it's just horrible. So I'm glad that Frances talked about her role as kind of an icon for the LGBTQ community as we observe Pride Month uh, in June. Absolutely. And I, as well as the links I said I will put in the show notes, there will also once again be a link to an article which Francis wrote uh, about homosexual astronauts, which I think is really important. And as we're in Pride Month, has that extra importance. So if you haven't read that one already, make sure you check that out in our show notes. And as always, the full unedited video of that interview will be up on our Patreon page along with our book draw. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Okay, thanks for listening. That's it for this week. It was a big interview, and after a few weeks away, I'm sure that we both have lots of things that have caught our eye in spaceflight over the last month, which we haven't spoken about. So next week, how about we do an episode which is just what's caught our eye in the last month? I think that makes sense, right? Yeah, we probably have a ton to talk about, and I need to sit down and make a list because there's so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like we just gloss over things rather than actually talk about them. So next week we'll have an episode like that. We did one in January or February last year as well, similar thing. So we'll do that. Um, Anyway, then we'll go back to normal. So thanks to all our listeners who got in contact with some comments about our Skylab episodes. It's always great to hear from you. And a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. We've got another book draw being done today. I know I should have done it at the start of the month. I was on holiday. Uh, So keep your eye out for this week's video. See, See if you've won this week's book. This month's book. Anyway, anyone can sign up. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash space and things. And a big thanks to all those who have continued to share the podcast with your friends. That really does mean a lot to us both. So if you haven't done so already, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcast or giving us a star rating on whatever podcast platform you use. And make sure you've hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean.